I want to welcome in now David Bonson, the Bonson Group CIO. David, it is great to have you on the show. I want to start, David, with, with all the economic data we got this morning. Inflation, I was just talking to Julie about that. Personal income, consumer spending. There were folks, I'm sure, David, they looked at that data and they said, listen, that is more data, that is more evidence that we have a, an economy that is cooling but not crashing and maybe as rare as it is, Jay Powell actually did stick that soft landing. How do you see it, David? Well, I agree that the data is reasonably benign. It doesn't reflect a red hot economy. It does reflect some degree of slowing down the pace of advancement, but nevertheless still hanging in there. The only thing I'd push back on is that Jay Powell stuck the landing. I, I think that um, this is totally unrelated to the Fed activity for the very reason that the Fed shouldn't have to try to stick that landing. It's impossible for 12 people around a conference room table to guess right what every nuance and, and variable from employment to prices, wages, all the other factors you brought up are going to do. So far, things are pulling together here, and we're going to see what 2025 brings. We will see what it brings. In the meantime, we're not sure even what the next few months of this year are going to bring, right? We don't know, you know, what size the next couple of cuts from the Fed are going to be. We don't know who's going to win the election. We don't know the outcome of some of the geopolitical uh, elements we were talking about. And you think all of this is going to result in some increased uh, volatility. How should investors sort of approach that? Well, I think that both things we're talking about, both the preconditions for Q4 that you just described and what I'm about to say I think investors should do are permanent. This, the idea that there's geopolitical instability is a permanent part of human nature, uh, that there's some form of domestic political uncertainty is a, a permanent part. It's true. It's heightened with the unknown of the election. Um, but, but even the issue of monetary policy, for the first time, I actually think there's quite a bit of certainty. Is it going to be 50 in November and 25 in December or vice versa? I don't think it matters at all, but we know that they're going to be taking another 50 to 75 basis points out of the Fed funds and pursuing more of the same next year. Uh, the, our solution is always in dividend growth equities because we simply believe cash flow is one element that allows you to not have to try to guess exactly what's happening in the macroeconomic uh, environment. For income investors, they get consistent growing cash flow. For accumulators, they actually benefit from volatility. So we've just philosophically centered our money management around dividend growth equity. Let me ask you, David, about another big theme we, we talked a lot about on the show this week. Uh, Chinese authorities taking these steps, David, um, to boost their struggling economy. I'm curious whether you think um, they're taking the right steps, whether, David, you think they'll be successful. And two, do you want to buy Chinese equities here? Um, well, we do not, but they most certainly are likely to continue uh, going higher around the monetary stimulus. They had been doing some form of fiscal stimulus most of the year, uh, but I think to avoid a lot of the mistakes that Japan has made and very candidly, a lot of the mistakes the United States has made, they've been more gun shy on some of the monetary. Now, look, a 50 basis point reduction in the reserve rate and some of the other um, elements that they've done is still a long way from full blown quantitative easing, for example. But this was unexpected, and that's why markets have responded the way they have, is the bank of uh, the People's Bank of China had largely indicated they weren't going this route, and Xi seems much more open to using monetary stimulus. That gives some degree of asset price boost behind it. You ask what I would do. Well, I would prefer to be a free country that allows a full-blown <laughs> free enterprise system. And so I'm a big fan of the rule of law and other forms of, of capitalism. That's what I would do. But no, I mean, in their system, this is probably the best thing they can do for short-term asset prices. And on balance, is that, do you think, I mean, we don't know the outcome of this stimulus yet, but on balance, do you think that that is positive, not just for asset prices there, but potentially for, you know, economic demand globally, for example, U.S. companies that, that sell their goods into China? Yeah, I do think that there is a marginal benefit there, as a matter of fact. And, and it's something I've studied for a long time, that there is a, a global interconnectedness here that everyone's well aware of. In this particular case, though, we, we're so used to thinking of China as exporting to us. 
And, and, and so when U.S. demand weakens, therefore, it hurts China's, uh, you know, capacity as, a, as an exporter. Um, this is a little bit different, though. And I think that uh, China's overall economic health now just leads to a, a knock on effect in, in terms of their other trading partners, not just the United States, but other counterparties in Asia and Europe as well. David, you follow politics very closely. If you were to look at the polls, Trump Harris, they would suggest it's a toss up. What do you think the market wants here, David? You know, is it a Republican sweep, Democrat sweep, divided government? Yeah, it's funny. I just wrote about this today in my dividendcafe.com. We did a special election issue and I make the argument that divided government is historically something markets have liked quite a bit. Um, the possibility of a Democrat president with a Republican Senate is not something I think markets would fully reject. Um, there, the, look, the uh, energy in financials, the overall regulatory environment, and certainly tax policy, there are reasons that the market would prefer probably a Republican in the White House. But if they're going to have a Democrat in the White House, particularly one talking about higher taxes on capital gain and all these other things, I, I don't think they're ever going to pass with a Republican Senate. So divided government, gridlock has historically been pretty good. And, and that's been the bulk of my adult life. And I'm 50 years old. So divided government has worked well for markets. It certainly has historically. David, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.